Uh, welcome, welcome everyone, near and far, that's joining our service today. So we're going to sing Surely the Presence, as we do. Sally has very kindly offered again to play for us Surely the Presence, which Sally will play through twice, humming first for us to join in if we wish to, and then singing the words second time through. Thank you, Sally. <clears throat> and as Sally returns back to the circle, we take a moment to feel that wonderful energy, that beautiful, soothing, comforting, loving, reassuring presence that is the activity of God, that here is present with us. As we create this space together, by being together in this room and also those online that are joining us, we create a sacred space together. And we give thanks for being present today, for each of us that can be here. We know that there are others that would choose to be here, but cannot be. And we take a moment just to remember Patricia, who is just recovering. The first service she hasn't been to for ever, probably. So I... We take a moment just to bless Patricia. We remember Dorothy with much love and know that she is moving forward, creating her life in her new way. But they are forever part of us, part of our circle, part of who we are together in unity. So we build on this sense of connection that we have with each other through unity and, of course, through God. And so with that thought and feeling in mind and heart, let us read the opening <coughs> prayer, the invocation that Charles Fillmore wrote out loud together. I am now in the presence of pure being, immersed in the Holy Spirit of life, love and wisdom. I acknowledge thy presence and thy power, O blessed Spirit. In thy divine wisdom, now erase my mortal limitations, and from thy pure substance of love, bring into manifestation my world, according to thy perfect law. So let us take these words, <coughs> this feeling of connection, into our silent time now.
Good afternoon, everyone. The message today is, We Are One. And the reading from <clears throat> Daily Word goes like this. Jesus was clear to those who gathered in his name when he shared, Just as I have loved you, you should also love one another. The actual quote is from John, chapter 13, verse 34, and this says, By this everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. His followers observed this direction by gathering in spiritual communities, sharing freely with each other, and giving readily to those in need. Their commonality was a willingness to live in love, I remember Jesus' words and feel my loving connection to all other beings on the planet. I know that they are all truly spirit, intimately linked through the energy of divine mind. I send my energy out in the form of peace and love in my work, play and service to others. I share oneness. In doing this, I am reaffirming my connection with infinite love and with all life. In oneness we live in love. Can I repeat, ask you to repeat after me just once the phrase, in oneness we live in love. In, in oneness, oneness we live in love. Thank you. Those of you here last time will remember that uh, I promised you a story. <laughs> this is a new departure for me. I've not tried doing a story before, so we'll see how it goes. I, I don't actually have any conscious recollection of really forming this story. It kind of formed in my mind, as stories sometimes do, and it sort of has grown over the last couple of months to uh, what you're going to hear today, which is probably a slightly cut-down version, given the amount of time we've got. So... Are we sitting comfortably? <laughs> then I'll begin. Once upon a time, there was a man. He was a good man. He'd been brought up in the right way. He was polite. He was hardworking. He was good to his friends. It's what everyone in our society today would generally call a good person. And this good person had a lovely wife. And he built himself a wonderful home. And this home stood high on a bluff, looking out over a lake, with mountains in the distance. You can imagine this perfect vista. And this man was justifiably proud of himself, of everything he'd achieved. And one evening, as he was, he'd had done his work for the day and was resting, and he decided to go up onto his balcony, because he had this beautiful bedroom, with a lovely balcony outside, with a balustrade right in front of the view. And he stood there with his gin and tonic, admiring this view and congratulating himself on what a wonderful life he'd had. And he was still only in his mid-years. He had so much ahead of him, but he seemed to have achieved it all. Everything he always thought when he was young, he had achieved. It was all there before him, all there for him to enjoy. But somewhere... Deep inside of him, he had this nagging doubt. He thought, well, surely there, there must be more. There must be something else. And he'd been self-reliant all his life, building on himself and doing everything for himself. But he suddenly found himself reaching out. He wasn't quite sure what to or who to. But he was reaching out and asking the question, what else? What is the meaning of my life? Where else can I go? And the instant that question came into his mind, he became aware of, more than saw, this tiny speck far off in the distance. And this speck started to grow as he watched it. And it grew at a really rapid rate. And as it grew, he realised it was a bird. It was a bird like nothing he'd ever seen before in his life. It was magnificent. It was an iridescent blue, but as it's as it flew around in the evening sunlight, 
every colour of the rainbow shimmered and shone. It was glorious. And it was there, majestic, flying before him. And it gave out this song. It wasn't so much that he could hear the song, he could feel this song, this song of love, this song of content, this song of everything he could ever want in his life. And this man knew he had to have this with him for the rest of his life. This was now the most important thing in his life, and he watched it. He watched it until the evening fell. And then every night for the following week, he went up there onto his balcony and looked out, and the bird was always there. And he came more and more to realise he could not live without this bird in his life. So he hatched a plan. And the following night, he came up onto his balcony and had some bird seed. And he put some bird seed out on the balustrade. And sure enough, the bird came down, alighted on the balustrade and started to eat the food. And it seemed very tame, so he took some bird seed in his hand and he held it out to the bird. And the bird started to eat out of his hand. So he gently but firmly put his arm around the bird and lifted it up. And in the meantime, part of his plan had been that he'd had this cage, actually more of an aviary, built. And he took this bird and he put it in the aviary and he knew that now he would have this magnificent bird for the rest of his life. And he was so proud of it, he invited all his friends around. They all came to see it. They all wondered at the magnificence of this bird. But interestingly, none of them heard the song. But they all saw the magnificence. And they all told him what a lucky man he was and how perfect his life was now he had this beautiful bird. Yet, every time he saw the bird, it seemed to be a little less iridescent. The colours didn't seem to be quite as nice. The song didn't seem to be quite as beautiful. And as the colours faded and the song diminished, he went to see it less and less. And his business life took over and he went off to, to work for a few days. And he came back <clears throat> and he went in to see the bird. And there, on the floor in the cage, colour gone completely, the bird was now just grey. Part of its feathers strewn around on the floor, no song, completely motionless, completely lifeless. The man looked at it and we remember he was a good man a tear started to well in his eye as he remembered the magnificence this bird had had, how beautiful it had been, how it had been the very focus of his life. And he, a supposed good man, had let it die. He opened the cage, he went in and he knelt before the bird. The tears now flowing freely down his face, he started to sob, to sob uncontrollably. He picked the bird up in his arms, shaking, wondering at how he could have been such a dreadful person to have let this bird, the most magnificent thing in his life, die. How could he have done that? He collapsed on the floor in a fetal position, shaking, shaking, shaking. And when people asked him later how long he'd been like that, he said he couldn't remember, but it seemed like an eternity. And as he carried on shaking and crying, tiredness took him over and he fell asleep. He fell into a, a horrible sleep of nightmare, of blame, of self-recrimination. But in that final moments before he fell asleep, he'd cried out for help from anybody. Anything that would bring this bird back to life, this thing that had been the focus of everything that was important to him. He desperately wanted help. And in his sleep, the nightmares started to subside. A peace came over him, which he couldn't understand. A peace and then a serenity. He felt, he felt sort of at one with everything. And he opened his eyes and he looked out and he realised he must be high on a mountain top because spread out before him were all the mountains, the wonderful vista that he had from his house. There it was, spread out even further. He could see mountains for miles, beautiful, beautiful scenery. And he had just this sense of complete peace. And it wasn't as though he was seeing this vista. It was that he was part of this vista. He was integrated with it. And it was just magical. 
He didn't understand how after the dreadful thing he could do, he could be enjoying this beautiful, beautiful space. And as he looked around, he looked down. And his heart leapt with joy. There was the bird. In the valley beneath him, the bird was there. It was flying. All its colours as iridescent before. The song filled the heavens. Everything was wonderful. And he thought, well, it's a bit strange. It doesn't seem to be flying quite as I'd expect. And he realised that actually he was, he was seeing the lake that was normally in front of his house. And he was seeing the reflection of the bird. So he looked around, he looked high, everywhere, where was the bird? And as he looked over his right shoulder, he saw feathers. He looked over his left shoulder, he saw feathers. He looked down, he saw feathers. He, I am the bird. I don't understand how, but I am the bird. And this is magnificent, I feel free. Everything is wonderful in the heavens. This is magnificent. And then he felt, as we sometimes do in dreams, he felt himself falling, 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 falling. And then with a shake, he woke up. He was still on the floor, on the cold, hard floor, still curled up in the fetal position. Oh, my God, it was just a dream. It was just a dream. I've still killed the bird. And he looked down. But the bird was gone. He looked around him. The cage was gone. This is amazing, he thought. Maybe, just, just maybe, just maybe there's hope. He leapt to his feet. He rushed up the stairs of his house, out onto the balcony, and there was the bird. As beautiful, as iridescent, as song-filled as it always had been. But now he appreciated it more. He understood that the bird was free, the bird was where it was supposed to be. And in that moment, he made a life-changing decision. He decided that the thing to do was to be and to allow. He became a great philanthropist. Who knows, maybe even joined Unity. <coughs> but he changed his whole life. And every evening for the rest of his life, he would go up into that balcony, up into that high place, and he would see the bird flying, and of course the bird was always there. And after decades, he went up onto the balcony one evening, and the bird was still flying, but it turned. And it looked at him, it looked straight into his eyes. And as it flew towards him, he closed his eyes for the last time. And he awoke to feel the wind beneath his wings, to feel that magnificence, to see that beautiful vista, to feel that complete oneness, that complete beingness, that complete love. And he knew he was that love. But even as he was enjoying the truth of that moment, something wasn't quite right. Somewhere something was amiss. And as he turned and wheeled above the mountains, above the lake, he looked, and in the far distance, just at the limit of his vision, there was a bluff with a beautiful house on it. And he felt, rather than saw, a soul reaching out, a soul in distress. And he flew as fast as his wings would carry him, and he knew that he would do whatever it took. He would sacrifice whatever it took to bring this soul back to oneness. That's the story. And one can see it as a story of love, one can see it as a story of an awful lot of different things. But those of you who have been involved with unity for any amount of time will know <coughs> that we talk about three aspects of consciousness. There's the conscious mind, the subconscious mind, and the superconscious mind. The conscious mind is where we make our decisions. It's where we generally live our lives. Our subconscious is the aggregation of all of our life experiences, all of our thoughts, all of our feelings, all of our emotions. It's where, fundamentally, we have our sense of identity. Um, 
it's it's where we recognize our being it's where we perceive everything from and there are those who say and they know better than i do that more than 95% of our decisions come out of the subconscious they're made completely without our being involved so this good man this good man had lived his life building up his subconscious in a way that most of society would recognize as being pretty fabulous and the instant he had had that thought of maybe there's something different the bird had appeared the bird of course is the superconscious the bird being the the total oneness that exists in truth the truth of who we really are but in his subconscious mind he had always worked on a basis of being self-dependent of doing the things he wanted to do so he had captured the bird and imprisoned it in the fre in the prison of his own mind that imprisoned splendor he had as some people often say he had created god in his own image that's what he'd done with the bird he had taken it into the way he thought it should be and of course of necessity that bird had to die but he had put so much of himself vested so much of himself in that bird that image or whatever other gods we have created for ourselves that when it perished and died he effectively went into grief and in that moment he let go of everything that was him that was what he identified with and in letting go the cage the cage of his mind disappeared and that was when he got the glimpse the glimpse of the real superconscious when he looked down into that lake and saw that reflection and looked over his shoulder and saw his feathers he got that glimpse of who he really is who we all really are but he still had this world to deal with he found himself on the floor the false god had disappeared the cage had disappeared and the most important part of the story for me was when he went back up into the high balcony which of course is his higher consciousness he made a choice he made a choice to be different he made a choice to change the hardest thing for any of us to do he made that choice to change in reality we all capture birds and imprison them all the time time after time after time after time and of course we will carry on we give them more opportunities there will always be more birds until we find that one true bird and at the end did he die well either he died or he let go of the conscious environment that he created for himself the difference makes no difference and then he was one in the superconscious and the superconscious can only serve that monistic entity it can only serve it can only be and it will always be there instantly flying as fast as its wings will take it to bring us back to oneness and of course that's the message that peter read out um, and the important things in here apart from the message itself in oneness we live in love it's talking about sharing freely with each other. We are all one. We are all one in the superconscious. There is no separation. Feel my loving connection to all other beings on the planet. Again, a message of oneness. And service to others, I share oneness. It is in serving. And in this message, the bird shared completely. It knew no different. But that's the message for us all. And finally, I'd like to turn to the Bible reading. <coughs> Because my dear and wonderful friend, Tom Thorpe, this is his favourite quote in the entire Bible. And I'd like to just read a little bit more of it, because this is the, the giving of the new commandment. Um, I give you a new commandment that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. And that is Tom Thorpe's definition of Christianity. If you have love for one another. Well, <laughs> that was a, a beautiful story, Paul. Um, very uh, soul-filled, heartful, and um, meaningful. 
and I think it probably touched us all in different ways. Certainly it was, uh, I felt the freedom and that of flying free and trying to capture that and we can't capture that. It's joining it rather than capturing <coughs> it. Well, Paul, thank you. Bless you. You've honoured us today with sharing your story. Bless each of you for showing up today and each of you online. We take a moment to give thanks with sharing our love offering, blessing, our way of giving back in the way that we can. Um, giving money is one of the ways. Many of you give with your time and your service through the board and through volunteering. Um, you all give in your own way. So, But this enables us to be present here at the Friends Meeting House and to share as we do. So let's take a moment just to take that love offering or the thought, that, that thought of giving as each of you give to unity in the ways that you do. And take a moment just to, to bless that giving. And know that as we bless, whether it's the money substance itself or our time and energy that we share, we are grateful for the opportunity to give, to serve, as Paul describes so beautifully. For we know that as we give, we truly receive. And so with that knowing that giving and receiving are one, let's speak the love offering blessing together that's in the program. Divine love, expressing through me, blesses and multiplies all that I have all that I give, all that I receive, and my awareness of all that I am. Truly, we are grateful. Amen. Okay, so we are going to move into our peace song.